in the air, center field, pretty well hit. Griffey going to the wall, trying to time it, and made the catch. Oh, my. Oh. What a play by what? Junior. No score here in Seattle. On April 27, 2016, Nintendo of America agreed to sell its majority ownership of the Seattle Mariners baseball team. Its CEO, Howard Lincoln, who once ran Nintendo of America, will retire once the sale is finalized. For many Seattle fans, it's the end of an era, one with a few highs and many lows. For others, it's a surprise. Not that Nintendo is selling the team, but the fact that Nintendo owned a baseball team. Yes, it's true. Since 1992, Nintendo has had a majority ownership of the Seattle Mariners. But this is a story of more than just money and sports. Nintendo's interest in Major League Baseball sparked a wave of controversy, and in many ways, changed the game. This is the story of Nintendo's quest to purchase the Seattle Mariners. And we begin with the history of baseball in the Emerald City. In 1967, Major League Baseball added two additional teams to the American League. The first was the Kansas City Royals. The other was the Seattle Pilots, named in honor of the Boeing factory headquartered in the city. Baseball had existed in Seattle since the late 1800s, but this was the first time a team would play in the majors. The Royals and Pilots were scheduled to begin play in 1971, which would give them more than three years to assemble a front office and build a team. However, politics soon intervened. Missouri Senator Stuart Symington was anxious to start play as soon as possible. Kansas City had just lost the Athletics, having moved to Oakland after the 1967 season. Symington wanted play to resume quickly and threatened to introduce legislation that would affect the owners. So the owners revised their timeline. The Royals and Pilots would begin play for the 1969 season. Each team had only 18 months until opening day. Expectations were high, and the Seattle Pilots were underprepared. Major League Baseball introduced rules and regulations to the team and the city. They had to upgrade Six Stadium, which the pilots were renting from the city of Seattle. The league wanted an additional 20,000 seats. They also expected a new domed stadium by the end of 1970. Right from the start, the pilots were under immense pressure. The owners went over budget on stadium renovations, so they made sacrifices in other areas. Restrooms were only big enough to pass code. Water pressure was so low that players were forced to shower at home after the game. Concession stands lacked basic utilities. On opening day, some fans couldn't even sit down. Their seats were still being installed. Rather than build a core of young players, the pilots chose to compete immediately by signing veterans like Jim Bouton and Tommy Harper. In their opening day game, the pilots beat the White Sox 7-0, but from there, things only got worse. The losses piled up. They traded a promising young outfielder by the name of Lou Pinella to the Royals. He went on to win Rookie of the Year. Attendance was down, and the team was losing money. The owners secretly negotiated to sell the team, and in 1970, the Seattle Pilots were sold to millionaire Bud Selig and became the Milwaukee Brewers. Seattle had a taste of Major League Baseball for only one year, and they were outraged. Washington State Attorney General Slade Gordon, representing the city of Seattle, sued the American League for breach of contract. Seattle continued to build the Dome Stadium, the King Dome, with the hope that a baseball team would return. In 1976, they got their wish. Major League Baseball agreed to give the city a team in exchange for dropping the lawsuit. The American League officially added two new teams to its roster, the Toronto Blue Jays, and the Seattle Mariners. On April 16, 1977, 
the Seattle Mariners played their first game. They lost 7-0 to the California Angels. What followed were years of disappointing performances and poor attendance. Through the 70s and 80s, the Mariners never made the playoffs or even had a winning season. 20, 25 years from now, you're going to want to say, I was there when Ken Griffey Jr. made his home debut. So don't forget that on Monday night. There's a drive into the gap in left center field, in deep left center field, and Henderson's not going to get to it. It's off the base of the wall. And Griffey to second base in his first major league at bat, a ringing double off the 375 marker, and we have seen that all spring. Welcome to the show, Ken Griffey Jr. In 1989, the fortunes of the Mariners began to turn. The team called up a promising young rookie named Ken Griffey Jr., who quickly became their premier player. Along with ace pitcher Randy Johnson, the team's outlook began to change. In 1991, the Mariners had their first winning season. Despite the growing positives, owner Jeff Smullyan was in financial trouble. He had borrowed a substantial sum of money to purchase the team in 1989. The 1991 season saw the Mariners lose $5 million. Security Pacific Bank felt that the Mariners were not a viable business and asked for the $39.5 million loan to be repaid or refinanced. On December 6, 1991, Smullyan put the team up for sale. Rumors spread that the Mariners would move to St. Petersburg, Florida, but thanks to a clause in the team's lease at the Kingdome, Local investors had until March 27th to make an offer that would keep the team in Seattle. Slade Gordon, now a Republican senator and a diehard Mariners fan, had seen enough. He remembered the lone year of the Seattle Pilots and how devastating it was when they left for Milwaukee. He took it upon himself to step in once again and put together a team of investors to purchase the Mariners and keep them in Seattle. Gordon began calling local companies. His first call was to the wealthiest man in the area, Bill Gates of Microsoft. He declined. His next call went to a video game company, one he had previously helped with counterfeiting issues during his time as a member of the Senate Commerce Committee, a company that was dominating the video game market. Nintendo. On the surface, Nintendo seemed like a good choice. They had cash, and tons of it. In 1991, the company had $3.5 billion in sales and accounted for about 80% of the video game market. Their president, Hiroshi Yamauchi, was listed in Forbes as one of the world's richest men, worth an estimated $1.5 billion. Nintendo also had roots in Seattle. Nintendo of America president Minoru Arakawa had lived and raised a family in the area for the past 15 years. They were also one of the area's largest employers, employing some 1,400 people. Near the end of 1991, Senator Slade Gordon met with Minoru Arakawa and Vice President Howard Lincoln at their headquarters in Redmond, Washington. He didn't waste any time. He immediately inquired about Nintendo purchasing the Seattle Mariners. Arakawa and Lincoln were skeptical. They had little interest in baseball and had only attended one game in the past, mostly to discuss business. Lincoln also had doubts about a Japanese company purchasing an American baseball team. It could result in bad publicity. The two were unsure, but decided to pitch the idea to Nintendo of Japan president Hiroshi Yamauchi. It was the longest of long shots. He was very careful about Nintendo's finances and consistently stayed out of the public eye. He cared about baseball about as much as he cared about video games. Not at all. In December of 1991, Yamauchi phoned Arakawa and Lincoln with his answer. He offered to buy the Seattle Mariners outright for $100 million cash. Arakawa and Lincoln were stunned. This offer is not being undertaken as a business, but rather as a form of community service. Japan has the United States to thank for its miraculous post-war recovery and economic growth, and Nintendo has also been allowed to do business in America. 
I owe a great debt to the United States, and I want to do everything in my power to pay it back. Hiroshi Yamauchi. On Christmas Eve, Senator Slade Gordon received the news. Although it was good, Gordon and city officials knew a 100% Japanese ownership would not be approved by Major League Baseball. To get around this, Gordon organized the Baseball Club of Seattle, composed of Yamauchi, Arakawa, and other investors. John McCaw of McCaw Cellular, Christopher Larson of Microsoft, Frank Schrantz of Boeing, and John Ellis of Puget Sound Power and Light Company. Together, they offered to buy the Seattle Mariners for $100 million in cash, with an additional $25 million to invest in the team. Yamauchi would be the majority owner, contributing $75 million for a 60% ownership. It was the first time an investor outside of North America had attempted to purchase a majority ownership of a Major League Baseball team. John Ellis called it the most highly capitalized and most financially stable operation you have ever seen in baseball. Mariners owner Jeff Smullyan was ecstatic, as expected. He quickly approved the deal. It seemed as though the Mariners would be staying in the city of Seattle. But, as one Mariners spokesperson put it, Jeff can say yes, and Major League Baseball can say no. On January 23, 1992, the day the deal was formally announced, MLB Commissioner Faye Vincent commented on the offer. Baseball has addressed the issue of ownership of its franchises and has developed a strong policy against approving investors from outside the United States and Canada. It is unlikely foreign investors will receive the requisite baseball approval. Faye Vincent. He does! What a catch by Ken Griffey! And that was the special one from number 24. Although Seattle locals were thrilled about the Nintendo investment, the rest of the country wasn't so sure. During this time, anti-Japanese sentiment seemed to be at its highest since World War II, brought on by increased competition in the economy and a recession. In the auto industry, Americans were increasingly ditching their Fords and GMs for Hondas, Nissans, and Toyotas. They were cheaper, required less fuel, and seemed more reliable. While American car companies saw little to no increase in sales, Japanese car companies were flourishing. In 1990, Japan had a $41 billion trade surplus with the United States. 75% of it was from automobiles. Many argued that Japan had unfair trade practices and were too strict when it came to importing U.S. goods. Relations grew worse when in January of 1992, Japanese politician Yoshio Sakurauchi deemed American workers lazy. The source of the problem is the inferior quality of U.S. labor, he said. They want high pay without working. That same month, the Sumitomo Corporation of Japan won a $122 million bid to add driverless cars to the Metro Green Line in Los Angeles but public outcry forced the LA County Transportation Commission to cancel the contract. Nintendo's bid for the Seattle Mariners couldn't have come at a worse time. A poll conducted by CBS News in March of 1992 revealed that 57% of adults were, quote, bothered by a Japanese company owning a Major League Baseball team. There were even accusations that Nintendo was involved in illegal gambling activities and therefore not qualified to own a baseball team. Others pointed out that professional baseball in Japan wouldn't allow an American company to buy a team, which was true. Nippon Professional Baseball had a rule that stated foreign investors could only own up to 49% of a team. Why have a policy of not selling baseball teams to foreign interests? Because in areas where you can prevent it, you shouldn't sell off valuable core chunks of your culture to anybody, unless it's in your country's best interest. 
Baseball is one of those rare American institutions that, because of its special congressionally granted status, can do pretty much what it damn well pleases. Thomas Boswell, Eugene Register Guard MLB Commissioner Faye Vincent's argument was based on one of the many unwritten rules of the game. It was the same type of rule that enforced racial segregation in the game, before Jackie Robinson ended it. During the December meetings of 1991, baseball's ownership committee did discuss policies on foreign ownership. However, they couldn't finalize the rule and decided to table the discussion for a future meeting. They figured the issue wouldn't arise anytime soon. After Vincent's statement that it was unlikely Nintendo's offer would be accepted, he took a 10-day vacation to Jamaica. Those that were for the deal were outraged and accused Faye Vincent of being xenophobic and a hypocrite. If Canadians could own teams, why not the Japanese? Dear Commissioner, did I miss something? Or is this 1942 and not 1992? What would possibly keep you from letting Seattle not only keep its baseball team, but grow and flourish with it? Frankly, I'm surprised and embarrassed by your arrogance. You seem ready to turn down the bid of the baseball club of Seattle without even giving it a chance or an audience. This story is bigger than just baseball. The world is watching. Lane Noonan, The Seattle Times. After the public backlash, Faye Vincent stepped back from the spotlight, stating that ultimately, it was up to Major League Baseball's 10-member ownership committee to approve the sale. Once approved by the committee, the offer had to be approved by 11 of 14 American League owners and 7 of 12 National League owners. Senator Slade Gordon, who had tirelessly fought to keep baseball in Seattle, stepped in once again. Back in 1922, the Supreme Court ruled that Major League Baseball was exempt from antitrust laws, therefore giving them a monopoly on professional baseball. Senator Gordon promised that if the sale did not go through, he would do everything in his power to have Congress review this exemption. Over the next few months, the two sides would meet and come up with a compromise. Forty-nine hundred miles away across the Pacific Ocean, Hiroshi Yamauchi waited. He found it strange that his bid to buy the Mariners was so controversial, not only in the United States, but in Japan as well. He was accused of being arrogant and bringing unwanted attention to the country's trade surplus with the United States. Nevertheless, Yamauchi was content, whether the deal would go through or not. Of course, it is my money, and I'm glad I could pay it, he said. But this is not business. What do I know about running a baseball team? Throughout the spring and early summer, discussions took place between the Baseball Club of Seattle and Major League Baseball. From there, a deal was struck. Hiroshi Yamauchi's role with the team would be passive. He reduced his ownership stake to 49%, leaving 51% to the other local investors. Rather than have the team be controlled by a club, the investors agreed to give control to an individual. They chose John Ellis of Puget Sound Power & Light, a Seattle native. He became chairman and CEO of the Mariners, despite owning only 1% of the team. On June 9, 1992, members of the ownership committee, which included future president George W. Bush, unanimously approved the sale of the Seattle Mariners to the Baseball Club of Seattle. For the first time in Major League Baseball history, someone outside of North America owned a slice of America's pastime. In the years that followed, the Seattle Mariners came alive. In 1995, managed by former Seattle pilot Lou Pinella, the team won the AL West division and made the playoffs for the first time ever. Their first round opponent was the New York Yankees. 
It all came down to a pivotal Game 5 to determine who would move on to the championship series. And the old one pitch on the way to Edgar Martinez. Swung on the line, that would be a line for him, he's in. Here comes Joy, here is Junior to third base. They're going to wave him in. The throw to the plate will be late. The Mariners are going to play for the American League Championship. I don't believe it. It just continues. Oh, oh, my. The Mariners would make the playoffs three more times but could never get past the championship series. Despite this, it was clear that Nintendo's investment brought stability to the Mariners and the city of Seattle. Nintendo's ownership of the Mariners did more than help the team. They quickly struck a deal with Ken Griffey Jr. and released a series of games under his name, exclusive to Nintendo consoles. They would also regularly promote their products during home games. Fans could even order food and drinks using their Nintendo DS handhelds. It could be argued that Nintendo's involvement made baseball a global game. The connection to Japan brought a new wave of talent to the league. Hideo Nomo, Hideki Matsui, Yu Darvish, Nori Aoki, and of course, the Mariners' own Ichiro Suzuki. Ground ball, base in and a right field. In 2004, after retiring from Nintendo, Hiroshi Yamauchi turned over his ownership of the Mariners to Nintendo of America. He passed away in 2013, having never attended a game. Today, Nintendo still owns about 10% of the Seattle Mariners, and in the long run, it was a worthy investment. In 1992, the Mariners were worth $125 million. Today, they're estimated to be worth around $1.2 billion. But it's hard to call the Nintendo era a success in Mariners history. Many fans criticized Nintendo and Hiroshi Yamauchi for being the ultimate passive owners. And the team hasn't made the playoffs since 2001, which is the longest drought in Major League Baseball. As a result, the average attendance at games has dropped by more than half. Hopefully, with this new ownership group, the Mariners can get back on track. Currently, they're battling for first place in the American League West Division. But there's absolutely no denying that without Nintendo's help, we might be calling them the Tampa Bay Mariners. That's all for this episode of Gaming Historian. Thanks for watching. Funding for Gaming Historian is provided in part by supporters on Patreon. Thank you.